Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Hello, Farhad. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing, Mazen? Good Hello. to see you. Yes, I can clearly, I can hear Hi, you. Hi, Farhad. How clear. are you? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for accepting the invitation. It's a, a great honor and pleasure to have you on board. Thank you. Likewise, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. I just switch on. Hello. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. So <laughs> now it's the right background. Home office. So I can. I think there is a, a problem in the net. I can hear you very, very easily, loud and clear. Uh -huh. uh, I, I was saying that thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for having me with you tonight. Yes, I'm looking forward to our discussions. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, Farhad. Perfect. I think Dr. Mohammed Hosni will join us very soon. Great. How is the weather now in uh, Zurich? Oh, fine. Uh, finally, it's good again. We had some very cold days of like 13, 14 degrees. Very unusual for this time of the year. Now we are back to 25 and sunshine, which is a little too cold for July, but still we enjoy eating outside, which is lovely. How is the weather in Dubai? Actually, I'm not in Dubai now. I am in Turkey in, um, oh, in a place. Okay. <laughs> in, uh, in a place which is. Um, I think maybe it, it is on the same level of uh, of Zurich because here it's very not very cold. It's acceptable, but it is okay. uh, cold weather. Let's say. Okay, cold for your standard. So around yeah, 20, yeah. 25. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somehow, nice. yeah, maybe twenty. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I don't know whether you have received, um, I think you have received yes. uh, the video. We wanted yes, to make I, I sure. I have received that. And uh, great. Uh, I'm going to play the recording great. after the, uh, the presentation of. Yes. Great. Professor Liu from uh, the UK is joining now. Nice. Christopher Liu. Hello. Hello, Christopher, how Hello, are you? Good evening. Very well, thank you. I'm, I'm driving, how are you all? <laughs> We're fine, Please thank you, how drive are you? safe. <laughs> Great. So I'll just get to my destination. I'm at your... Um, So please, please start. I'm, I'm going to listen in. Thank you, Christopher, for joining us. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm going to start. And uh, if Dr. Mohammed uh, uh, couldn't start with us, maybe he will join us later. So I'm going to play the recording of uh, Professor Farhad, and then we will uh, have the discussion. 
So uh, good evening, everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to this session, to this distinguished session in uh, the Colonia uh, series in uh, Sinjab Academy Club. I'd like to um, uh, welcome Professor Farhad Hafizi. He is a renowned uh, international uh, figure, actually, in refractive surgery and keratoconus management. Uh, he doesn't need to be introduced, of course. Uh, everybody knows him very well. And I would like to thank uh, as well uh, Professor uh, Christopher Lute for joining us as an esteemed panelist. So um, uh, I'm going now to play the recording of uh, Professor Farhad Hafizi regarding the application of corneal cross-linking in infectious keratitis. Uh, after the recording, we are going to uh, discuss with uh, Professor Farhad and um, uh, if you have any questions, please write the questions in the question and answer uh, uh, place, not in the uh, chat place, please. So let me share the recording. Okay. I think we have to play it first. I would like to thank Professor Mazen Sinjab very much for giving us the opportunity to present our new data in the Sinjab Academy. My name is Farhad Safezi from the ELSA Institute in Dieti Zurich, Switzerland, and I would like to speak about puck cross-linking for infectious keratitis and give you an update what is state-of-the-art in 2021. These are my financial interests. And uh, cross-linking and per cross-linking have come a long way since the beginning and the establishment of the technique back in 2003 in Zurich. We developed a, a method that nowadays is used approximately 200,000 times a year, and you will find more than 2,000 scientific publications in Medline. Uh, this is the very first device we built back in 2003 and 4, the UVX1000. Today, cross-linking has become a global standard of care with a CE mark and FDA approval, and the success rate and classic EP of cross-linking for progressive keratoconus is very high. What makes us particularly proud is that publications show that in countries that have a central registry for keratoplasties, since the introduction of cross-linking in these countries, the rate of corneal transplantation has dropped by 50%. Now, what we did not realize when we started corneal cross-linking almost 18 years ago is that cross-linking does not only stiffen the cornea, it also acts as a disinfectant. Other fields of medicine use the combination of UVA and riboflavin, such as blood transfusion medicine, that's the Mirasol product. It's a way to reduce the microbial load in blood transfusion products. And the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology developed a technique called solar disinfection, where you put drinking water of bad quality into the sun, into a PET bottle, you add riboflavin, and after a few hours, no more bacteria and fungi, even viruses and acanthamoeba survive in these bottles. Fluences are extremely high, up to 100 times higher than what we currently use in the cornea. Still, you must keep in mind that in every cross-linking procedure, whether you call it CXL or PAC-CXL, this differentiation is just a term. 
to make the difference between different indications, but the method is the same. CXL and FACCXL do not only stiffen the cornea, at the same time, they increase the tissue's resistance to digestion, so collagenases cannot act as efficiently, and they kill everything living on the surface of the cornea and within the corneal stroma. Knowing this, we started looking into infectious keratitis, and we soon learned that this is a very different disease from keratoconus in terms of volume on a global level. It is one of the leading causes of global blindness, and it is particularly difficult to treat because in many countries Uh, yes, Farhad. Uh, I think there is the a. I, is that I, clear? I, no, I, I have multiple black uh, bars on our video, and now the video froze for me. And um, I think you tagged Farhad over the entire video, but uh, the part of the screen is covered with the black, with the black. Uh, uh, how do you say rectangle? I I would send you via. Um, See, this is what I oh, see. Okay. I don't know what the others see. I, I cannot really see my my video. Mm. I will send it to you That's via YouTube, uh, via WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah I think. But, uh, um, I can yeah. see on the YouTube that there are black bars as well. Uh, yeah, around, somebody, random, it, uh, like did you? There. I don't know really why. Yeah, I, I think uh, your technician put the name Farhad and, and a black background. My My video cannot be seen. Um, see, I don't see yes. anything. Uh, just a second, let me check. Let me check why it's still like this. It's, it's this, yeah. And somebody is, is moving around all the time. It's, um, I think, I think your, your Technical crew must have modified the video because so we never put Farhat over my video. Do you, do you but, see it uh, on the screen? It's very strange. I don't hear it anymore either. And, but nobody modified the, uh, yeah, yeah, very. Is it, I think, mm. um, is it the same on the YouTube channel? Yes. On the YouTube, there is yeah. some... Video is blocked. Yeah. No, I stopped the video. I stopped it now, just to, to be sure okay. what's going on. Mm. Let me see. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing first. Yeah, this... Um, the original we sent you worked flawlessly. This is the modified video. Yeah, yeah. I... I'm, uh, I uh -huh. No, it, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just playing the one that you sent to me and uh, I can see it from my screen very clear without, uh -huh. without, any, uh, black, uh, without any black bar, uh, bars or I can see it okay. very clear because on my screen. Now, now it anything. also says, uh, so it's the, it's the technical support because on, when I look at you, I read Farhat over the entire screen when I look at your image. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now uh, this is a watermark. You mean a the watermark, watermark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the watermark uh, was clogging the. I had the watermark yeah, yeah. on a black screen, obscuring the entire video. Now uh, there the was not only a watermark; is... there was the entire video. It was uh, because by, um, if you go okay. into the chat, um, the the yes. attendees are writing: "Is it a hacker? It was blocked all the time. Video is blocked." We don't see it. Mm. Um, what I can do is I can I can um, I can give the presentation now. It's no problem. Uh, if if you can, the, can you play it from your enough. computer? I I can play it from mine, of course. Yeah, and um, let me see. Just have to make sure that I. Uh, if you allow me to share the screen, I will let it run now. Share screen. Uh, yes, uh, you can share. Yes, of course. Okay, so I will let me let let me know via WhatsApp or here. Mm.
Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Just stop one, sorry, quick time player. Now it should run, optimize for video share sound. Now. And uh, yes. cross-linking and per cross-linking have come a long way since the beginning and the establishment of the technique. Is it okay? In 2003 yes, it is. In Zurich. We developed a method that nowadays is used approximately 200,000 times a year, and you will find more than 2,000 scientific publications in Medline. Uh, this is the very first device we built back in 2003 and 4, the UVX1000. Today, crosslinking has become a global standard of care with a CE mark and FDA approval, and the success rate in classic EPI of crosslinking for progressive keratoconus is very high. What makes us particularly proud is that publications show that in countries that have a central registry for keratoplasties, since the introduction of cross-linking in these countries, the rate of corneal transplantation has dropped by 50%. Now, what we did not realize mm -hmm. when we started corneal cross-linking almost 18 years ago is that cross-linking does not only stiffen the cornea, it also acts as a disinfectant. Other fields of medicine use the combination of UVA and riboflavin, such as blood transfusion medicine, that's the Mirasol product. It's a way to reduce the microbial load in blood transfusion products. And the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology developed a technique called solar disinfection, where you put drinking water of bad quality into the sun, into a PET bottle, you add riboflavin, and after a few hours, no more bacteria and fungi, even viruses and acanthamoeba survive in these bottles. Fluences are extremely high, up to 100 times higher than what we currently use in the cornea. Still, you must keep in mind that in every cross-linking procedure, whether you call it CXL or PAC-CXL, this differentiation is just a term to make the difference between different indications, but the method is the same. CXL and PAC-CXL do not only stiffen the cornea, at the same time, they increase the tissue's resistance to digestion, so collagenases cannot act as efficiently, and they kill everything living on the surface of the cornea and within the corneal stroma. Knowing this, we started looking into infectious keratitis, and we soon learned that this is a very different disease from keratoconus in terms of volume on a global level. It is one of the leading causes of global blindness, and it is particularly difficult to treat because in many countries you are facing increasing antimicrobial resistance. What seems to be easy nowadays in cooler countries with purely bacterial infections might become increasingly difficult once our quinolones do not work anymore, which can be in 10 to 15 years, so antibiotic resistance. And also mixed infections. The more humid and hotter the climate gets, the more bacterial fungal mixed infections you see, which are exponentially difficult, more difficult to treat. So you have the diagnostic dilemma for a beginner, let's say, who has a hard time identifying the type of infection he or she is facing. And then you have the therapeutic dilemma because you have to address bacteria and fungi at the same time. Puck cross-linking does address both at the same time because it kills unspecifically. And lastly, one major factor are also costs related to the treatment, and it is not the cost of the medication. In many countries, it is the cost of the doctor. Looking at all of this, please keep in mind, these are the main elements. Antimicrobial resistance, according to the WHO, in 30 years, more people will die of antibiotic resistance then we'll die of cancer and diabetes put together. Then 
the challenge even for experienced ophthalmologists to handle mixed infections and on a global level, the doctor's costs. Now let's dive into the cross-linking reaction. What do you need for successful cross-linking? We know nowadays that you need light, riboflavin, and oxygen. And when you look at CXL, so the keratoconus treatment, then we then the whole field started with the first in line here with the Dresden protocol. So 30 minutes of treatment at 3 milliwatts equals 5.4 joule. Now the Bunsen Rosco law says you can have the same effect if you keep the same total energy of 5.4, but you deliver the the whole uh, treatment three times faster with three times the energy and so on. This works, but it does not work infinitely. You cannot accelerate down to 10 seconds. There is a cutoff that is determined by oxygen diffusion. My group showed this back in 2014. If you go too fast, then at a given moment you run into trouble because oxygen cannot diffuse fast enough, and this is for keratoconus treatment. Now, in puck cross-linking, this is not the case, at least not for um, the conditions we tested down to two and a half minutes. You still maintain the same bacterial killing efficacy. Why? Again, we showed this also in 2014, because apparently killing of bacteria is not depending on oxygen. In 2008, we published the very first case series on applying Dresden protocol cross-linking on infectious keratitis, and it was a good success, and this stimulated us to perform more research, and five years later, we defined the new indication as PAC cross-linking, and PAC stands for photoactivated chromophore for keratitis. Not riboflavin for keratitis, but chromophore, because we already knew back in 2013 that there might be other substances that we can use to treat infectious keratitis than riboflavin. Then, in the next step, we went into a clinical study, and we were, we were very enthusiastic to see what Karen Makdumi and this group in Sweden have done. They have treated 16 eyes with bacterial keratitis using the Dresden protocol, and 14 of the 16 eyes did not need any additional medication. So this was puck cross-linking alone back in 2012. This was a breakthrough in, in um, uh, the promises this treatment modality can deliver, and it stimulated us to start stimulus studies. We performed a study in Egypt. Here, the ethical committee did not let us perform puck cross-linking alone. We had to do this as an add-on therapy to antimicrobials. And uh, in this case, we were too enthusiastic because we went into huge ulcers of seven millimeters and bigger, as you can see here. And then we learned that if you go into these terribly big ulcers, that the time to healing with additional cross-linking is not substantially different from normal medication. In other words, we wanted too much from this new method. So in the next study, we were more modest and said, okay, this might have been too much for puck cross-linking because the ulcers were almost perforating. Let's try it in smaller ulcers. This is what we did. Boris Kneiser published uh, his uh, Israel study, and we were part of the study group back in two, uh, 2020. And he compared mid-sized ulcers against mid-sized ulcers treated not only with antimicrobials, but with uh, cross-linking. And here he saw a distinct and significant acceleration to healing, which means faster healing, less doctor's visit. And do not forget one thing, cross-linking does something no medication can do. It does not only kill the bacteria or the fungi, it increases the resistance of the tissue. So theoretically, the final scar, this is not easy to show in a laboratory setup, the final scar should be smaller. This was one of the patients from the study. You can see the hypopion already present in the anterior chamber. 
Now, what should we do in the next step? As you can see, all these treatments were performed in a fast way, accelerated way, but still using the original total energy of 5.4 Joule. Now, in the next step, we went back to the laboratory and we checked what happens if we increase the total energy from 5 to 15 Joule. What we could show then, and we published this last year in Konya, we then massively increase efficacy in bacterial killing. We go from 60% to almost 100%. So higher total energy is very beneficial. And this is what we used in our prospective multicenter randomized clinical trial. And as you can see, China was one of the study countries uh, at, uh, with Professor Xiao Chen. And in this prospective study, we used fluences up to 7.2 Joule Patients were randomized either to medication only or to pack cross linguinum only, uh, ulcers up to four millimeters in diameter. And what we found was astonishing. We found that when comparing the medication to the cross linking alone, there was no difference between the two groups. So the days to healing in pack cross linking alone were not significantly different, and the success rate was not significantly different. In other words, pack cross linking alone was just as good as medication. And one on one single treatment, no five visits at the doctor, which is very important because follow up in many countries is difficult. So no significant difference. We presented these data at uh, the European uh, ESCRS Congress and uh, received um, the refractive award for that work. Now, what we would like to see in the future is give this technology into the hands of the global population because right now in many areas of the world people don't even have access to modern treatment. And one major reason is because in many cases we use very expensive infrastructure like an operating theater that is not present everywhere. So another vision of ours was to simplify the treatment by bringing the treatment to the slit lamp. Imagine slit lamp based cross linking. Imagine it in a country like India, where you have very developed megapolis and then other areas that are rather rural and have no good connection to medical care. We know that both for keratoconus and for keratitis, you should treat as early as possible. So serve remote areas. Don't bring the patient to the doctor, bring the doctor and the machine to the patient. And when the machine is small and portable and fits on a slit lamp, you increase coverage. We call it democratizing cross-linking. And in developed countries, it also has an advantage because you can use a dedicated slit lamp for your infectious cases. And some university clinics, clinics here in Europe already do this. And you can use the, the device in several locations and also in a simple procedure room out, outside the operating theater. And this is why we took a few years of our life, carved them out and developed uh, the concept of slit lamp cross-linking. The idea was born 10 years ago when my MD-PhD student Olivier Richo showed me the newest generation of very tiny LEDs. And then it took a number of years to develop the concept and finally in 2020, we launched a CI device. It's a machine that allows all modern protocols using pulsed or continuous light. So from Dresden protocol to pulsed, high fluence, accelerated, iontophoresis assisted epion cross-linking and you can use it at the slit lamp, but also in the laying position if you want so. Now, looking at this from the playing devil's advocate, I look at it as a skeptical colleague who says, why, how can you do cross-linking at the slit lamp? What about infection risk? Let's look at infection risk. I don't think that this is a problem for these reasons. First of all, in the case of keratitis, the cornea is already septic. You have a cornea with keratitis, so why do you take the septic cornea into the aseptic operating theater to perform an antiseptic procedure? This does not make sense. 
And the second reason is you learned before that every cross-linking procedure makes the cornea sterile. It kills everything on the surface. So if I reduce the anterior microbial load, load, I might as well do this in a slit lamp settings in the, in the procedure room. And third, performing surgeries in the procedure room is nothing new. And you will find large studies doing this in cataract surgery with thousands of procedures and in intravitreal injections, and the rate of infection is not increased. So if we can perform cataract surgery and IVOMs in the procedure room, why can't we perform cross-linking in the procedure room? Another argument could be, you cannot perform cross-linking at the slit lamp because you need light, oxygen, and riboflavin. Let's look at these factors. Light can propagate in the lying position as good as in the horizontal, as good as in the vertical sitting position, right? It doesn't make a difference. Oxygen molecules are everywhere, so they don't care whether they have to diffuse horizontally or vertically. What about riboflavin? Well, we tested this and published this four years ago. If you apply riboflavin and then the patient sits up, you have up to one hour before you can measure any difference due to gravity in the sitting position. So do not worry about riboflavin and gravity. You have enough riboflavin in this cornea. And lastly, fixation. Um, some colleagues say, how can the patient become at the slit lamp? Please don't forget that the modern protocols take 10 minutes for, uh, 10 minutes for keratoconus treatment and four to five minutes for puck cross-linking. And during that time, see how well these patients fixate. In the upper image, you cannot even see that this is a movie except for the flickering of the screen. What helps tremendously is the fixation target that you can present on the other eye, the red fixation target that we use for gonioscopy or retinal exams. That's very, very helpful. And lastly, you put the patient into a comfortable position, and as I said, puck cross-linking only takes four minutes. I often give the patient my chair, the comfortable one with the armrest, and then the patient really doesn't move. You will find the technique published in the Journal of Refractive Surgery um, beginning of this year. And then one last glimpse into future directions. Riboflavin-based cross-linking works really well in bacteria, and it also kills fungi, but, but to a lesser extent. So what can we do regarding fungal treatment? How can we improve on this? You, see, you will see some publications that report a poor outcome, but if you look carefully, there was one group from India that reported a very poor outcome last year, but my group wrote a reply to the journal and Harminder Dua from Nottingham wrote a reply because we had serious concerns about uh, the study setup. And on the other hand, don't use it don't use puck cross-linking in huge ulcers. Start in smaller ones and increase the total energy. Everything that is published so far uses the low energy of 5.4 joule, and we know now that we need more. Look at this case of fungal keratitis. In this case, you see the OCT. We treat it with high fluence, 7.2 joule, twice within 48 hours. So 14.4 joule in two settings and look at the nice healing. So we know that we need higher fluence. That's one point to increase efficacy. And the other point is there is riboflavin and there is rose bengal. You've heard of rose bengal. It, it gets excited in the green, so it penetrates deeper. And apparently rose bengal has a good profile even in acanthamoeba keratitis and in fungal. So the question is, why can't we perform both puck cross-linking in one go. Do a combination of riboflavin, UVA, and rose bengal green. We treated the first patient a few days ago. So combining rose bengal and riboflavin might be very interesting. So in conclusion, puck cross-linking overcomes antibiotic resistance. It will reduce the final scar. It we can improve global access by performing slit lamp based puck cross linking. And in the future, in the very near future, we can even increase efficacy by increasing fluence 
and by combining several chromophores. So I'm looking very optimistic into the future. This is our research group. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Farhad, for the uh, very nice update. And I would like to open the discussion now. Um, of course, I would like to welcome Professor Mohammed Husni and uh, Dr. Nancy Raqad. So I will open the discussion and I will uh, hear uh, from Professor Christopher as well, Christopher Lou. Um, if you have any uh, comments, uh, if you'd like to add. Thank you, Professor Sinjab. I think um, this is wonderful work that um, Professor Farhad has been doing for many years. And um, I think slowly the word is out and more people come to understand the beauty uh, of uh, PAC cross-linking. So I really want to um, thank him and congratulate him uh, on this really, really wonderful work. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Luel. Just want to intercept and thank you for the kind work spot. As we all know, this is a team effort from our Swiss team on one side, and I'm very happy to share the audience with, with uh, Mazen Sinjab, with Mohamed Hosni, Dr. Raka. There are so many groups now that, that do amazing work um, and uh, publish clinical data we all need. Thank you, Farad. Uh, Mohamed Husni, do you want to add? Well, um, uh, first, uh, can you hear me, guys, right? Okay. So, uh, first of all, that, that was an amazing presentation. I have heard uh, Professor Hafizi uh, in many. Yes. Um, I, I'm a, I, can you hear me? Yeah. So, so. Um, I have heard uh, Professor Hafizi in, in, in many occasions speaking about PAC-CXL and every time he, he adds uh, uh, pretty interesting stuff to the presentations. And um, I really think this is the future for bacterial keratitis, bacterial and infectious keratitis in, in general. We do have, we do have uh, quite a chunk of uh, bacterial and fungal pathology mixed pathologies in, uh, that we see at Cairo University. And we have treated uh, quite a few with, uh, well, actually tens of cases with uh, PAC-CXL. But the only difference that we, we did is that we use it as a supplement. We have the protocol um, of the university in the department that we use it as a supplement to a classic antimicrobial treatment. And we, we haven't had failures with fungal uh, keratitis in the patients that, that we used uh, Paxi-XL with, in spite of that we use the 5.4 joules. We don't, we don't use the 7.2. So even in these patients, supplementing the, the, our treatment, our antifungal treatment with Paxi-XL did make a big difference. And we, ha we have, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Hafizi knows this because we have shared the slides and the pictures of the patients. And uh, we have uh, patients with filamentous fungal infections that really improved after one single dose of Paxi-XL combined with the uh, natamycin that they were on. And, and we have actually um, a fewer cases of candida, again, that showed um, uh, unprecedented resolution after uh, uh, applying the Paxi-XL. So I, I'm, I'm a believer because a lot of, of, of my colleagues are not, I do not believe that much in Paxi-XL in infectious keratitis. Um, and the, the, the reason for this is that we, I'm, I'm actually now treating a patient that uh, had a, a bacterial infection post CXL. He was doing a CXL for keratoconus and he ended up with an infectious keratitis. And to convince this patient that we will do another um, uh, cross-linking was, was extremely difficult. He, he was recommended to Casey's who was actually uh, a son of one of our, our colleagues. And, and I did pack CXL for this patient. And, and he is, he's, doing, he's doing much better now. So, um, no, I am a true believer. I, I do appreciate the work of Farhad Hafizi in these 
subcategory uh, of patients. Um, we were all, you know, like um, not not very um, uh, excited or not not enthusiastic about the idea until he published or he he actually began to present his pr primary results. Um, I was honored to be a very small part of the Swiss PAC CXL study. But again, I, I don't think our contribution would, would have made a difference. These guys are doing, no, no, honestly, these guys are doing very, very good work. And I think they are leading the way in uh, using uh, CXL in, in treating bacterial keratitis. And I remember very, very well in the SCRS meeting, I think it was the SCRS meeting a few uh, years ago, when Fer Fizi said that in, in, in Daphos they were discussing three things, uh, global terrorism, global warming and antibiotic resistance and and uh, the the only hope that we have in the future because the molecules of antimicrobials are getting less and less and less and they are very rare and the our only uh, strong hope in treating uh, bacterial keratitis is in uh, CXL so thank you Freddy you've been you've been a real help in this for the patients Um, is it okay to uh, answer, you, Marcel? Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for your for your kind words, Mohammed. And and uh, um, it is it is uh, very very nice to hear that uh, that you uh, use uh, that you are promoting the, the use of pack cross linking more and more all all over uh, Egypt and far beyond. Um, I would I would like to invite you to try um, to increase the fluence with the current chromophore with riboflavin. Um, we we know that uh, Professor El Masri has an MD PhD student who uh, did a rabbit study. Um, I was involved in designing the protocol and we used Tenjul um, and with quite some nice results which fits nicely to what we have published in Cornea last year on bacteria. And if we think about the fact that the 5.4 joule were a limitation that was 20 years old, because at the time we thought the endothelium could not bear more, we know that the endothelium can resist much more energy. And in, in an infection, everything is opaque anyway. So the transmission of light is, is not the same. So going to 10, um, even 15 joule, and we have had another case with Boris Kneiser three weeks ago, where we did twice 10 within six days. And, and it, was a, it was an advanced keratitis that we could heal. I think there's a lot of room to, to improve efficacy with riboflavin alone, and a lot of room in the future with the combination procedures. A combination mean you mean with antimicrobials or the combination with rose bengal? Um, I think um, uh, both, but in this case with rose bengal. So maybe just just not to. We have about 50, 50 attendants right now, and certainly more uh, via the stream, streaming platforms. I just want to make it very clear as per today. Um, Pack cross linking with riboflavin is, is the standard that is accepted by those who believe in the technology. And I, I advocate the use of high affluences, 10 joule, I think without any doubt. Then if we look in the, into the future, into what we try to develop now might, might become reality in two or three years. We have treated a first patient uh, with a combination of uh, riboflavin 365 nanometers and rose bengal in the green light. And um, this was a case of uh, severe acanthamoeba keratitis. And um, I used uh, 10 joule in riboflavin plus immediately afterwards another five joule for, um, for uh, rose bengal and the patient is doing fine. It, it, it starts healing. We might even do a, a second procedure. And this is now science fiction for the, not science fiction, but this is clearly the future. Um, there are no machines out there yet, except for prototypes that we are using, but it shows the potential of the technology in Acanthamoeba, which we couldn't really address until now. And I think cross-linking with riboflavin high fluence has a good chance in fungal. It might, it might have, uh, uh, and there might be even room for combination of riboflavin and rose bengal for fungal. 
I think for bacterial, we are doing really fine, but for mixed, high fluence and in the, in the first step and maybe in the future combination procedures. Totally agree. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear this and, and uh, we all remember it took, it took the initial cross-linking concept a, a few years um, to, uh, to, to gain momentum. Um, we have Christopher Liu with us. He knows the situation in the UK. Um, it, it, and now it is uh, CXL Pachygonus is established, but between 2003 and 2010, it, it took a few years. I think every new concept takes years, especially if the concept is, is evolving uh, so dynamically. So I'd like to invite anybody who can, please don't think that you can't do the clinical research. Yes, you can. You just have to follow protocols. And I think Professor Hostin, Professor Lu, uh, Dr. Rakat, we are all happy to, um, uh, to help you um, uh, get going and gain your own clinical experience. I'm just looking uh, through, the, through the questions. Um, I, um, is there any danger for the retina from UV light? Um, yes, potentially, but even in the Dresden protocol, uh, the attenuation you get um, by, by the sheeting of the riboflavin prevents any light induced photoreceptor damage. So this has been shown by Eberhard Schwerl in 1997 already, so no worries about that. Um, so, um, uh, um, uh, Professor Mazen, shall I go through the questions together with Professor Hosni and Dr. Rakat, or what would you uh, prefer? Thank you for the yes, presentation, uh, Dr. Farhat. Uh, enjoyed it, but I was on the way, you. so just plugged in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sh we, we, there are plenty of questions. Um, is, it, is it okay if I read some of them and just comment? I believe so. Um, a nice idea. Um, an anonymous attendee says, how frequent the Rose Bengal? Please note, please don't mix clinical application with uh, laboratory uh, or, 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 or pilot, pilot uh, studies in, 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 in patients. This is, this is nothing that is in clinical, uh, in daily clinical application yet. So Rose Bengal, um, can't be applied and there are no, motion, no machines currently providing this type of uh, wavelength. How many times can we repeat PAX TXL in case of resistant treatment? Um, we have done up to two treatments with at least 48 hours in between treatments. Uh, Professor Hosni, have you done uh, more than two treatments in patients? Yes, I have done definitely more than one treatment in, in, in patients, but, but honestly, I haven't done them sequentially in the, in the, in, in the sense of like uh, 48 hours apart. In a patient, I think there were three patients and like two weeks apart from the first uh, okay. session. And did it help to do a second and, procedure? And it did make a difference because we had our, uh, a big question mark, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And, and hearing you say, saying that you, you can do up to 10 or even 15 uh, joules in these patients, I think this will, uh, will open up more uh, treatment options for the patients. And if, if, uh, if we have a case of, let's say, advanced um, uh, corneal abscess, I think uh, it is not unwise to go for the maximum uh, treatment in, in the term of joules because Again, what have you got to lose? We're not we're, in these patients. We are not very much concerned about the corneal endothelial viability because we know that we end up with an opacity, and eventually we will be needing a PK. So uh, yes, yes. I, at this, I, I strongly believe that if we if we do more than one treatment, you will get more of an effect uh, for the cross-linking on the microbial uh, keratitis. Um, we have three pieces of evidence supporting very high fluence. Uh, first, um, uh, Zylo Jr. published a paper last year with his father showing that the real uh, damage threshold for the endothelium is much higher than 5.4. Um, 
Second, we have unpublished data with, um, we just published the sub 400 protocol for ultra thin corneas and we have a second generation sub 400 that yeah. will be submitted based on 10 joule and we don't have any loss in, in, in uh, endothelial cell density. And the third, um, customized wow. cross-linking is wow. using up to 15 joule in the center and the cornea is not decompensating. And that's, that's for keratoconus, relatively transparent cornea. So uh, I think going into an opaque, um, hazy cornea uh, in keratitis, we are really safe to go. Okay, um, so, so you do and, have, you do, you, you uh, okay. Sorry, yes. So, so you are using up to 10, 10 joules you are using up to 10 joules in the sub 400 uh, corneas. That's very interesting. No. And you, you, you didn't have cases the, of endothelial uh, damage? No, no. no. What, what exactly, what has been mm. published uh, three months ago was the result of a study between 2015 and 19. And overlapping, we started optimizing the protocol. This will come out next year. So. We did another sub 400 with a baseline fluence, not of 5.4 joule, but of 10 joule, and then gradually went down. So 10 joule at 400, and no no change in endothelial cell density and deeper demarcation line. And this is why I'm very comfortable using high fluence in in um, keratitis cases. Well, that's that's very interesting, uh, Professor Hafizi, because. When you say deeper demarcation line, the, the, um, I mean we all, you know, memorized the the, the paper that you you published on the sub 400 protocol. And my my uh, my um, belief is that you've always aimed for demarcation line which is in the neighborhood of 70 microns above the endothelium. So what what can yeah. get deeper than that? Um, we, we go closer to the endothelium because. Um, because apparently the or it, this is this it's it's the ongoing uncertainty what exactly the demarcation line is, and we have seen oh, that yeah, course, having yeah. an even deeper mm. demarcation line still doesn't decompensate the endothelium, so sometimes it almost touches the endothelium okay. and nothing nothing in terms of uh, endothelial cell count after a few months. So this is where, why we are comfortable to go uh, deeper in okay. these very thin corners, yeah. I'm, I'm so my, my, my second question would be, in these patients with support, okay, so can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, my, my, my second question is, in, in these patients with very thin corneas, I think you go down to like 240 microns, and in these patients, you, you need like two minutes of cross-linking. Why, why is there any need for a high fluence for, uh, for the 10 joule? Um, because, because we learned that oxygen, avail oxygen availability is higher in thinner corneas, and that uh, we at least can partly compensate a loss in 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 uh, biomechanical efficacy with a higher fluence. It's um, I'm I've been thinking for months now on on a set of slides on how to put all these factors and, and just have them dynamically <laughs> changed like like fluence intensity yeah. acceleration oxygen availability and biomechanics and then and then you can see how how they they play together. Um, there's a lot of work involved uh, from my former postdoc uh, Dr. Sabine Kling who is a physicist and who helped us fine-tune the algorithm because it is quite complex. But indeed, this high fluence is at least in part can compensate for a relative lack of oxygen. So um, this is the, the reasoning behind it. I'm just- Okay, looking. that will be a very interesting set of slides. I think you, you should hire a, a very good animator. Yeah, but he, he will only do what we try to explain to him and it's, it's still not clear to me. <laughs> I just tried to, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. this works, okay. right? You, you, you are your yeah, yeah, sports and thinking mm -hmm. about it in the back of your head. But I see um, <laughs> Dr. El Balul has, uh, has asked, how do you use the combination of riboflavin and rose bengal? Do you mix the two? Please, this is experimental. If you want to say this was a treatment attempt 
uh, for ethical reasons in a patient that was unresponsive. This is not in clinics yet. Please don't try doing doing this. Don't mix it and you, you won't have the light. Do not try this at home. <laughs> no, please don't try it at home. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm looking through other... Um, I, but I would like to ask Dr. Rakad what, what her experience is in pack cross-linking, whether she has had high fluence patients um, um, and has tried high fluence in pack cross-linking. Uh, yeah, actually, I have had uh, a few patients that I had to use uh, a pack cross-linking with, and I did use uh, high fluence. Um, from the beginning, I did not use the, the, the dressing protocol for uh, even the early cases. Um, actually, my cases were uh, all fungal, um, uh, all fungal keratitis, and uh, one ecchymtamoeba keratitis that I had to use the uh, high fluence back cross thinking, and uh, um, it's it's immediate uh, effect. It's just you see the uh, uh, halt of the activity of the uh, infection. It's just the second day, it just stops. Mm -hmm. So um, it helped us just control the the infection at that time. So. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, how many, I use how many joule? Did... <laughs> At that Sorry. time, I remember we reached uh, a high fluence. Um, th this was like one and a half years ago, and uh, mm -hmm. um, in these two patients, I remember we went to uh, uh, almost. I, I think it was like uh, uh, ten. Uh, so we used uh, a high fluence. I I remember that. Um, so um, nice. Uh, yeah, it, it was high fluence from the beginning. We did not go uh, low with low energy. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Um, there's another question. Is there a pachymetry limit for the PAC cross-linking treatments? Uh, uh, Professor Hosny, could you comment on that? Well, uh, okay. Okay, now the SOP 400 um, uh, protocol answers everything. I didn't. I think you didn't go below 240 microns with the epithelium. That's what I believe, and I think this applies uh, the same for the uh, the pack cross linking. But again, um, uh, measuring the the corneal thickness in, in in these cases is a little bit tricky because you do not rely that much on the uh, uh, you know the optical. Uh, uh, devices and you have to do uh, an ultrasonic pachymetry again with the, with the high resolution probe you don't get very accurate results so i think i think a, a pachymetry in these specific sub uh, group of patients is is not is not extremely important i don't i don't think this is this is like the standard cross linking that we do for uh, keratoconic patients yeah i i fully agree because either the melting is not substantial, then we have a relatively thick cornea, nobody's worried. But if the melting went down to 200 micron of residual stroma, then all we want to achieve is the quiescent scar. We just want to look at the scar. So I frankly don't care yeah. about harming the endothelium. Yes. And I'm, I'm trying to preserve the eye as a structure. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, can we use puck cross-linking even if the infectious keratitis arrives to the limbus. Um, I would like to put this into the panel. Um, personally, I would say I would say yes because we all know that even if a small portion, we will never do a 360 degree irradiation of the limbus. And if you if you only um, irradiate a sector, and even if this were to harm the stem cells. Um, the eye will not decompensate if the if the other surrounding limbal area is fine. So uh, it, it it is not to me any um, any type of worry. We published an IOVS five years ago treating uh, rabbits 360 degree with 10.8 joule and uh, the stem cell markers on an mRNA level and the rate of uh, epithelial closure were unchanged towards control. So I don't think that this is a the stem cells are a major worry to us. Um, if I can add to this, um, I agree with Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Hafizi. I think the infection, if it reached the the limbus, then um, it's a it's a horrible infection. So mm -hmm. I would go with just pack cross linking, even if if it reaches the limbus, uh, because I'm salvaging the, the tissue. tissue. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm taking exactly. off a corner. So exactly, it's, it's, that's that's large. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I'm just looking through um, this. This is a question that is, um, I'm, I'm, I have two heads as a researcher clinician and as the CMO of Imagine, that the company that produces the slit lamp based cross thinking is slit lamp based cross thinking available commercially. Um, yes, it is. And, and on imagine.com, you can, you can see the distributors for the various countries. And uh, uh, now the 10 joule protocol is already implemented in the machine. So 10 joule can be done. Please, please contact uh, uh, your distributor for more information. I, I just put the website on, uh, on the chat, imagine.com. Um, then how many times, there was one question, would you perform puck cross-linking in any case of, uh, of uh, keratitis? And this is an interesting question. In, in early, intermediate or late, uh, Professor Hatsney, would, would you consider it only in late stages or already in early stages? Okay. I think yeah. uh, they are much more effective. You see, it's it's a paradox, it's a dilemma because the thing is, if if you do in in a, a cross linking in early cases, then you will definitely get the better result. The problem is some of the cases they will have a very virulent uh, microbe, a very virulent fungus, and we see, uh, uh, or uh, Pseudomonas, for example, and we see this a lot in, in Egypt, especially at Cairo University. We have a lot of uh, Pseudomonas cases being referred to us. So the thing is, these patients do uh, sort of, the, the infection, the coronal infection sort of escalates. And then you do a cross-linking if the patient is in the early stages, and then the patient might get worse. And the big question mark would be, did the cross-link him make him worse, or was was he going to get much worse than this if we didn't do the cross-linking? The problem in this, in this era, in this period of time, is that there are not a, a big um, army of believers in, the, in this technique. So if the patient goes to another doctor, for example, and he says, well, I've been to the ophthalmology department at Cairo University, and they did cross-linking for me, and then the patient has a horrible corneal abscess so that's going to, to um, spread uh, up to the sclera and has a big limbitis, and so the, the, the doctor would tell him, well, they shouldn't have done this. Most probably this fulmination and this worsening happened because of the cross-linking. We see this all the time. And mm -hmm. this is and, and not because the doc doctors uh, or colleagues are bad, but because they, they really do not believe in, in, the, in the technique yet. Not a big chunk of our colleagues do believe in, in PAX-CXL. And sometimes they do this out of, of good heart, just, you know, just delivering the right message that, you should not be doing cross-linking to these patients who are already having a corneal melting. So th this is a paradox. If you do this early on, on the disease, you'll get a much better result. But if, and when you do this later, and, and the, when, when you have uh, an infection that has reached um, uh, the backside of the cornea or the limbus, then you will not get the absolute terrific, uh, you know, dry uh, sort of fibrosis scar that you uh, do a, a, a good PK for. So I, I think it is a paradox. It is a paradox, and and it is it is it is a characteristic of of this era and, and this period of any any uh, you know um, uh, new procedure in its infancy. We've seen this all the time. I mean, uh, procedures that we have frowned upon for years came came. Um, we are now doing uh, doing them uh, every day. So I think I think yes, you you will not have a lot of collegial support when, when something goes south if you're doing a PAX CXL. This is the problem that we are facing, uh, especially uh, at least in, in, in Egypt and in Cairo. I don't know what, 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 how, how is it in, in the UK, for example, Dr. Liu? Well, I'm just um, at the moment following the story and I quite agree that um, it's not clearly defined as to when things should be done and what things and whether in combination, you know, including um, oral antibiotics as well, when uh, infection hits the um, limbus. 
And of course, um, when it comes to fungus, then it can penetrate um, into the eye uh, much more easily. So I, I, am, I am watching. Um, it is a difficult thing, as, as everybody agrees, that um, it is still kind of in evolution. It is not mature yet. It has a lot of potential, uh, and uh, especially uh, in different parts of the world, the applications will end up being different. For the moment, um, in Brighton, we're not a major referral center for co uh, corneal infection, and uh, we uh, managed to deal with most cases uh, quite quickly uh, and uh, effectively, uh, most of the time uh, avoiding surgery. You know, I think no more than once or twice a year do we need to intervene surgically to control infection. And further, um, eye protection in the UK is a very big thing, and um, uh, injury is, is not, um, uh, and including farm injury, is not, uh, not a very big thing. And people are very careful about uh, contact lens hygiene as well. Uh, so we, 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 we're okay, but of course it means that we're less uh, able to contribute uh, to the knowledge base. Mm -hmm. um, just to give my my two cents uh, about this, um, I I fully agree with both your approaches, Professor Hausner and Professor Liu. Um, I think what we should try to do is educate our colleagues um, to see puck cross thinking for what it is. It is a means of unspecific killing of microorganisms that is constantly evolving. That is for now doing a little better in bacteria than in fungi. It shouldn't be used yet in acantamoeba on a routine level, but it's getting better and better. And it does something that no medication can ever do. It increases the tissue's resistance to digestion. So if you keep this in mind and look at it, look at the whole thing without any emotion, then I would use puck cross thinking as an add-on in every, in every ulcer, in the small ones and in the big ones, being re realistic about what you can achieve in a big ulcer. What you do is you make it easy for your body to fight the infection because you reduce the load, but in a huge ulcer, you will, you will not perform any miracle. So if, if we can keep this in mind realistically, then, then, then I think by cross thinking already today would have a nice, uh, a nice place as an, as an adjunct procedure next to uh, what we commonly, do, commonly use in, in infectious keratitis of uh, bacterial, fungal, and mixed origin. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, uh, actually, uh, regarding the application of the PAC CSL in, uh, uh, in, in uh, the UAE, uh, where I'm working now, uh, actually, it's very similar to um, what uh, Professor Liu uh, has just uh, commented, uh, because uh, we rarely see the infectious, real infectious keratitis that are uh, very serious to, to, to combine with the cross-linking. Usually they are in early stages and uh, very um, responsive to, uh, to uh, medical treatment. Um, that's apart from being very rare. Uh, occasions to, to see the infectious keratitis. People are very uh, careful about contact lens hygiene. We have um, maybe 80% of the population is uh, are expats. Uh, they are young, um, multinationality. Uh, so the nature of work in the UAE is a bit different from other countries. So very rarely we can see the infectious keratitis where we, we need really to, to apply cross-linking for that. Makes perfect sense. Uh, there is one more interesting question in the Q and A: Is the use of Paxil uh, uh, FDA? I totally, I totally agree. Yes, Doctor Hasni. I totally agree with what Professor Sinjab uh, was saying because comment. Um, we, because we, uh, we have work for the university and and we work in our private uh, clinics and private hospitals as well and there's a, a 
totally different demographics in, in both settings. So we see the infections in the university hospital because we have loads of referrals from all over Egypt. But again, when, when you're treating your private patients in, in a very busy private um, uh, facility, no, you don't see infections uh, almost at all. So the, the, I think we are, we are lucky that we see these patients is that we are building up the experience but again it is unfortunate that that yes we do have these patients in in certain socioeconomic levels and they they, are, they all you know sort of drain into uh, very specific hospitals um, uh, one of them is is Cairo University Hospital so that's why we see those uh, I've always I've always always told my residents that if if we, if there there should be uh, world-class experts in corneal infections then it and we have treated them with all sorts of different things and we do have our in-house you know protocols uh, but but I totally agree in that in in the private settings it's uh, we don't see them at nearly at all so I think I think this is very understandable actually I I, I my, my question is how do you see these patients, Professor Hafizi, in in Zurich? I would have I, I would have said that you're the the least amount of cordial infections all over the world is in Switzerland. So, yeah. um, how how do you see these patients? Most probably are all yeah. fellows from other countries, I think. Yeah, it it is. You are absolutely right, Professor Hosni. It's not easy for us for us to get to high numbers. And this, this is where we need uh, the yeah. collaboration with the countries that have a higher incidence. And this is why the whole thing has to be so multinational, which makes it also more complex, as we all yeah. know, at the same mm. time. Absolutely. Um, there, mm. there was one question mm. that was interesting regarding the global spread of the technology. Um, Dr. Kamal asked, uh, is the, the use of cross-linking FDA approved for keratitis? Um, it is not yet. The, the CE mark for keratoconus came in 2003. The FDA approval for keratoconus came in 2016, so 13 years later. What we have now is we have a CE mark for infectious keratitis. Pack cross-linking is no longer an off-label use in the European community, at least with the slip lamp uh, approach, which is nice. It still is an off-label use in other countries, but I think we all are used to to off-label use uh, from uh, from the retina. Um, Professor yeah. Sinjab, would you like to uh, go through more questions or how shall we proceed? Can I just add one, co one comment? Um, actually, you're very lucky that you you have all these no humble numbers of uh, uh, chronic infections. We see a lot of numbers pulling every day. Um, we are at a tertiary referral hospital, uh, but we are, uh, still a small population but we do um like admit every day almost two or three cases of infective keratitis yeah. unfortunately um contact lens related um uh, uh, trauma with uh, agricultural material all kinds just name it post and uh, uh, surgical it's it's bad so i think we have to imply this uh, the pack cross linking protocol uh in our uh, uh, institution because we're, we're, yeah, we're a pool for all these uh, bad cases of infective keratitis. We've seen a lot. This is exactly where we should all pull our um, our forces mm -hmm. together and, and our possibilities together to push this field forward. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that so. That would make perfect sense. I, I know mm -hmm. that um, I, I was in Vienna last week and the AKH, the largest, the Vienna University Hospital, Gerard Schmidiger, the head of Konya. He, he just created a dedicated uh, slit lamp based approach uh, in the septic ward. He says all our ulcers, they are a tertiary center for draining a large number of the Austrian population. He say they will not enter my procedure room anymore. They are in a dedicated small room. And this is where all the septic patient will be handled. So um, Walter Secundo in Marburg, the co-inventor of smile surgery is doing the same thing now. So the pack cross thinking, um, uh, idea is gaining momentum and this is nice to see. Perfect. I think um, Dr. Uh, uh, Hafizi, you, you have answered all the questions that in the, the chat. So no more questions. I think maybe well, there is one question. 
Are there any complications of using the cross-linking for the infectious keratitis, apart from the scar, of course? I think it's, it's, it would be important for us all uh, to answer the question. If I may un uh, start, I haven't, I haven't seen complications yet. Um, unsatisfying outcomes, yes, because we still don't know enough. So some patients react wonderfully, others react less. So learning more about the methodology, but I so far didn't have uh, clear complications from it. Um, but I'm curious to hear Professor Hosni's, Dr. Rakad's opinion about that. Uh, for, for example, perforation, if any of the panelists um, had seen any perforation after cross-linking, for example? I personally never have seen a perforation and we, I, I think I've never had to be that clear in a letter to the editor than to the Indian study on deep fungal keratitis where both our group and Hamin Dua group, Dua's group wrote answers because this study was just raised more questions than gave answers. They had, uh, I think, more perforations in the PAC cross-linking group but um, the the study was the study setup was not something I would I would have done easily. So a very large, far advanced ulcers, but I've never seen a, a, a perforation even in advanced cases. Uh, Professor Hasni, have you seen perforation or other complications after this application? Well, I I have seen um, uh, perforations in in many. Uh, corneal bacterial infections and fungal infections. So in, in, the, in the patients, in the cohort that we did at Cairo University, there were, I think there were 74 patients and we did not see a single case of perforation uh, after pack cross-linking. But again, these were patients that were chosen, uh, well, let's say carefully. These were not advanced uh, cases. So uh, I think I think there was no uh, uh, perforation related to the use of CXL, mm -hmm. um, um, but I see we see perforations for, from corneal uh, infected corneal ulcers. We see them actually, um, but but to relate these to uh, the the single dose of PAC CXL that's now being standard at Cairo University, uh, I think would be uh, an offshoot. No, I didn't see perforations related to this type of treatment, no. Great. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Rakad? No, I think I think I agree with uh, Professor Hasni. I think I've seen this, although I saw a lot of corneal perforations uh, after infective keratitis. But I think if this happens, it's already a, a cornea that is uh, impending perforating. It's not because of the pack cross linking. This is what I yes. believe. So if it's perforated, it's, yes, yes. it's I agree. Perforated, I agree. Perforated, going to perforate. And it, it wasn't related to the pack cross linking, I don't think so. So I haven't seen this Great. after pack. Yeah. This is how I, I rationalize it. Yeah. Great. So it is a very nice message then to the audience that uh, pack cross linking doesn't have specific complications and it's, uh, let's say, safe uh, to go for it and to combine it with medical treatment. And of course, uh, to, to use it in, uh, in small um, or early maybe stages or moderate stages of the infectious keratitis, um, if you agree with me. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think we have uh, answered all the questions so far. Any comments, any... Um, any ads from the panelists before we close this session? Um, I just want to add that pack cross-linking is especially useful, even in the, in the early stages of infective keratitis in the non-compliant remote patients. Um, we had a child who came from a rural area and she was she came to the clinic not because of infection. Uh, she came just because of the whitening of her cornea, bilaterally. You can imagine that. And um, the whole situation was like so strange. So we cross-linked her um, on the day of the uh, when I saw her because I knew no way she was coming back. They wanted drops and then uh, 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 there were, 
I could read it that they were not coming back. Uh, so I gave her antibiotic drops, uh, a supply, and I uh, asked to cross think her, both her corneas. Um, sometimes they say no news, it's good news. I don't know what happened actually with her because she never came back. Um, yeah, but I could see that. So yeah, I would, I would, I would suggest doing an early fat cross thinking for patients who are non-reliable or uh, live remotely and you cannot guarantee their uh, compliance to visiting uh, visiting you. Very nice. And you did that uh, bilaterally in the same yeah. session? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So she, she was a child. Yeah, we gave how, her was old, uh, how was that? The, the, how old was, was the child? She, she was 11, but she looked like five. Man now rift and uh, very petite right. and yeah. Coming with bilateral cornea infection just because the cornea was white, it was like, oh, something so strange. So I decided to just be aggressive and mm. cross link here. Mm. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would know her because of, again. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, Professor Hafizi, for the very nice presentation and for the very nice work. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor uh, Lou, Professor Hosni, Dr. Raqad, for uh, their valuable input, for, for their valuable discussions uh, that enriched the, uh, the, the session. And uh, I'd like to thank the audience for being with us. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we are doing live streaming or, as well on YouTube, so um, a big part of, of uh, audience are following on the uh, YouTube as well. So um, uh, thank you uh, again for this session, and uh, I hope to see you uh, very soon with the uh, next uh, session in the series. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everybody. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.